Hey guys, let's talk a little bit about cognitive load and how it relates to scenario design. Sound good? Let's get started. Hi guys, my name is Paul Frampas. I'm the director of the Winter Institute for Simulation, Education, and Research at the University of Pittsburgh. Most of you know us as Wiser. Today I want to talk a little bit about cognitive load and scenario design. This is actually a vlog to complement the blog article that I put out a couple weeks ago that generated a lot of comments, questions, and uh, a number of inquiries. I thought I'd continue the topic and provide some more examples. When you design a simulation scenario, you have a lot of input into the cognitive load of the learners that are participating in your scenario, whether it's one learner or a team of learners. And we need to think about this as a deliberate decision-making process that is part of our scenario design. Because ideally, we want to channel the cognitive energy or the brain power that our scenario participants are putting into the case so that it is as much as possible focused on what they need to do if this was a real clinical case. We want to make sure that we're controlling the amount of cognitive energy that's spent with them thinking about they're in a simulation. Because after all, they know they're in a simulation. They are adult learners. They can't pretend they're not in a simulation. And I really don't think that that's what we want them to do. So what I want to talk a little bit about is how we make the decisions. How do we decide the inclusion points into a scenario, what gets excluded, maybe how we relay information to the participants during the scenario, and so on. I think this is really important because we want to make sure that as we create this stage for our learners to perform so we can help them get better, that we are creating an environment that counts on their thought processes and the, their brain power being dedicated to what they need to do to solve the clinical case or to care for the patient. Um, in terms of if it was a real patient, we want them thinking about what they need to do to take care of a real patient. We want to try to control or minimize the amount of thinking they have to do associated with the fact that they are in a simulation scenario. They are in a simulation scenario. They are adult learners. They can't forget they're in a simulation scenario. So we need to control what we present to them so that we can help them focus their cognitive energy into the care of the patient as if it was an actual patient. Trust me, you have a lot of control. You might not even think about it, you might not even realize it, but I'm going to go through some examples here and give you some ideas of how you should be thinking about it for the future. So how do we decide how to portray information in a simulation scenario? There's lots of decisions that get made with the creation of any simulation scenario. And I'm not going to go through them all, but sometimes it has to do with what equipment do we have, what environment do we have, how long do we have the learners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I want to focus on today is giving the simulation scenario participants information, how we give them information, so things like lab values, imaging studies, etc., and how they relate to the scenario design process and the overall cognitive load. A common way to decide what to put in a scenario is to think about how is this done in real life. In real life, they have to go to the electronic health record and look at the data. In real life, they have to go to the imaging studies or read the radiology report. Remember, our goal is not to simulate reality. Our goal is not to recreate the entire clinical experience. Our goal is to channel and accomplish learning outcomes that are associated with the learning objectives for the given scenario of the simulation-based curriculum. It's very, very important that we not make decisions based on how do they do it in reality. We want to make our decisions based on what do we need to do to accomplish the learning objectives. So let's talk about a couple examples. We'll start with some examples of labs, then we'll start, and then we'll uh, move on to some examples of imaging with the chest x-ray. 
Let's say you create a simulation scenario, and in that simulation scenario, your participant orders laps. And, and let's say you know, as far as the design process goes, that the labs are less important or the labs that they ask for are not important. We have a number of different ways that we can present that information to them. We can let them go into the electronic health record uh, and see a graphical display of what the labs are. We can give them information verbally. We can summarize the information and maybe give them a lab slip and so on. What's the difference? Well, let's look at this example on the screen now with the electronic health record screen. This electronic health record screen shows that there is a basic metabolic profile on the screen. There is uh, some other uh, uh, complete metabolic profile. Actually, there is a CBC and so on. But you have to look all around the screen very carefully to be able to um, know what you're looking for. And the other thing is you have to remember that People in a simulation scenario are always looking for clues. So when you present this information, if this was a real clinical case, they might want to focus only on the areas that are red, um, indicating an abnormal lab value. Okay, um, And this is data from a real patient, obviously. But the fact of the matter is, for this particular case, none of this matters. Okay, they ordered, let's just say they ordered the basic metabolic profile, they added on the elements of the complete metabolic profile, uh, and they looked at a complete blood count, which is represented down here. Let's say for our scenario, none of this really matters. If we give them this information in this format, they will work to look at every single number. They will, of course, be attracted to the ones in red, but they will also be looking at each individual value uh, of the ones in blue to make sure that you're not trying to throw them a curveball or trick them in the case. Okay, So they are spending a lot of cognitive energy. They are spending a lot of brain power to look at all these labs, and the fact of the matter is the labs have nothing to do with what we want them thinking about for the care of the patient in this given scenario. So maybe a better way to do it would be to give them a different format. Uh, give them the labs in a format that uh, some people think is easier to understand Then this is a different view from the same electronic health record. But same thing exists. All of these values uh, will distract the brain power from your learner to as they try to interpret it. So I have an idea. What if we just said the labs that you ordered are normal? And we said that and we injected that into the scenario. Okay? And we don't show them this information whatsoever. Okay? Now think about all of the brain power we have saved our learners because we didn't want them focusing on the labs anyway. Now, if your objectives have something to do with recognizing lab values that are altered or there are clues to what needs to be done to, for the care of the patient in the labs, you can pick and choose. Maybe you give them the abnormal labs. Maybe you give them the entire sheet like you see in front of you that makes the decision in your design process that we are okay with them spending cognitive energy here because that's what we want them to do as part of the problem-solving process. But we are making that deliberate decision to accomplish or help our learners accomplish the learning objectives, not because it's done that way in reality. Let's shift gears and talk about imaging studies. So when somebody orders an x-ray or a CT scan or an MRI or any kind of ultrasound, any kind of imaging studies, we have similar pathways by which we can inject the information back into the scenario so our learners can keep going with the scenario. Let's say we have a trauma patient and the trauma patient is having, a, it, it's a case of a pelvic fracture, all right? And 
our our learning objectives are solely about management diagnosis and management of the pelvic fracture okay um, and as part of a trauma patient workup the team or the individual involved in the scenario may order a chest x-ray now the chest x-ray is an important part of the primary survey of the trauma exam in real life no doubt about it and it would be right for them to order the chest x-ray but now we have some possible differences in the way we can report that data back to our learners right we can give them the image of a chest x-ray. So this is the image of a patient uh, that have a pelvic fracture. This is a chest x-ray. And now they have to spend time and energy and thought process in the interpretation of this chest x-ray. And this chest x-ray really has nothing to do with those deliberate objectives that we set out to see them manage a case of shock from a pelvic fracture okay so maybe if they order the chest x-ray we could just say chest x-ray is normal or we can have a radiology report that says chest x-ray is normal you can choose you get the idea because here's the issue so this chest x-ray which might seem normal to some, and I'll just go through a couple items briefly for those of you that might not interpret x-rays in the regular basis. But the learner will notice immediately, probably, that the left side of the chest has been cut off of the x-ray, because this is a real x-ray from a real trauma patient with a real pelvic fracture. And this chest x-ray has the left side omitted. Now, the learner is going to be thinking, oh, that's an inadequate chest x-ray film, and that is true for the interpretation of the film. But then they're also going to start thinking, are they trying to get me to miss a pneumothorax? Are they trying to get me to uh, interpret this as normal when it's really not normal? And they're spending all of this brain power and brain energy in this aspect of the chest x-ray that has nothing to do with the pelvic fracture. So now we're wasting simulation time and we're not even having the learners cognitively processing and working out the things associated with the pelvic fracture okay so there's another issue with this like a lot of chest x-rays in elderly people uh, you'll notice some white lines here and again for some people that don't normally interpret chest x-rays i'm not that's I want to help with with a couple things. These lines um, that are associated here are calcifications of the aorta. And they're normal with aging. But when we see them in the chest x-ray of a trauma patient, all of a sudden we have to spend more energy in there to try to determine do we think there's an aortic injury because we see these calcifications in the aorta. Okay, so real patient, real pelvic fracture, if I choose to recreate reality and give them this chest x-ray, there's going to be a lot of brain power and cognitive energy spent on this chest x-ray that doesn't even help them move in the direction of the learning objectives and the care that I want them to provide associated with the patient in shock with pelvic fracture. Okay, so maybe we just say chest x-ray is normal, move on. Or in the case, if, if you really, really, really want to give them an x-ray to look at, and maybe that is part of the diagnostic objectives for your scenario. If the chest x-ray is not where the answer is, then I would give them a more normal looking chest x-ray than this one from the actual patient. Again, we can make the mistake of trying to recreate reality and it will actually get us off track from accomplishing the learning objectives that we're setting out to do. So I hope these couple examples and at least taking a couple minutes out of your busy day to think about the decision making process associated with scenario design really lets you remember that you have a lot of control in the what the, what the uh, learners are thinking about or you're helping them move in a direction to think about certain things. And 
there are many decisions associated with the design of your scenario that can cause them to use extra brain power just associated with processing aspects of the simulation as opposed to helping to channel the energy, the cognitive energy, the brain power that they're using to solve the clinical problem in the direction that it needs to go to accomplish the learning objectives. So I hope you found this helpful. Uh, if you did, uh, or you want to read the corresponding blog post that I made, uh, my blog is at simulatinghealthcare.net. That's simulatinghealthcare.net. Go there, uh, subscribe if you like it, and you'll get an email every time that a blog post comes out. Uh, also, uh, the YouTube channel that you're watching this on for Wiser, you can subscribe to that, and we have lots of different uh uh, videos that come out on operations, administration, curriculum design, all things simulation. So it was really good to spend this time with you, and I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Uh, thanks for listening to this discussion on cognitive load and scenario design. Think about hitting that subscribe button below to subscribe to the Wiser YouTube channel. Thanks, and happy simulating.